Okay, so thank you again for coming. Um, if throughout the presentation you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box. If you put them in the chat, it's really easy for me to miss them. Um, it's easier to track everything in the Q&A box. So please do put your questions in there and uh, we'll answer them as we have time. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to pass it on um, to our presenter tonight is Dr. Thomas Green. Uh, he's an astrophysicist in the Space Science and Astrobiology Division at NASA Ames Research Center. Um, we're very lucky to have him here tonight to talk to us about the James Webb Space Telescope and all the great photos they've been sending back lately. Um, so thank you, Dr. Green, take it away. And uh, thank you, Megan. Uh, I'd also like to thank everybody for attending. I see we've got a lot of participants. That's great. And uh, I'm really happy to be here tonight to tell you about uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, or JWST as it's known. I, as uh, Megan said, I'm at NASA Ames, which is uh, just down the road from Santa Clara in Mountain View, uh, co-investigator on the near-infrared camera and the mid-infrared instrument on Webb. I've uh, started working on Webb in August of 1997, so about 25 years. And uh, uh, have taken material from a lot of people for this presentation. So uh, I thought I'd start off with um, why we put telescopes in space. It's a lot of effort to do that. Uh, you need rockets, you need to make them light, you uh, have to make them very uh, fail safe because you can't work on them. So if, uh, if they break, with the exception of the Hubble. So there are three basic reasons why uh, people uh, tend to do this. Uh, one is the uh, uh, the sky is darker in space. We don't have the scattering in the atmosphere. So we can see uh, more things, uh, higher sensitivity. And in particular, we can see more wavelengths, so more colors. Uh, the atmosphere is pretty selective into what uh, colors of light it lets through. It doesn't let in uh, uh, ultraviolet light because uh, if it did, we would all be burnt and uh, have cancer. So that's a good thing. And it also doesn't let in a lot of infrared light because of uh, water vapor and other molecules in the atmosphere absorbed uh, at those wavelengths. It's also very stable. The temperature doesn't vary if you put it in the right place. And uh, you can get more nighttime than we do. So uh, if you put your telescope in the right place, it uh, won't go through the whole day-night cycle. So it can be uh, very efficient in observing. This is... Um, uh, a picture of three observatories that uh, NASA did. They actually had a uh, series of four uh, uh, called the Great Observatories, and uh, they looked at different wavelengths. So Hubble is still operating. Uh, it was launched in 1990. Uh, so is Chandra. This uh, looks at X-rays. Hubble looks in visible light like our eyes and a little bit into the infrared, which is longer than visible light. Spitzer observed way longer in the infrared. Uh, it doesn't uh, work anymore. And uh, also, uh, we've got the, uh, uh, the, the GRO, it's a gamma ray observatory. Uh, next slide. Hmm, my slides aren't advancing for some reason. Oh, there we go. So uh, Webb observes mostly in the infrared. So why does it do that? Uh, what can you see in uh, infrared light? This shows the same region of the sky and uh, in different wavelengths. The left two were taken by Hubble. The left is uh, visible light. It's a very famous uh, region. This is a region of star formation in the Milky Way. Uh, I think uh, the snazzy term for this photo is called pillars of creation. It is, uh, it's also uh, this uh, dark patch. If we had a little darker sky, you could see it in the small telescope from our backyards, uh, known as M17, Messier 17, named after a French astronomer in the 1700s who discovered it. So what we see here in visible light is uh, uh, clouds of uh, dust and gas, and we can't see through them, so they're dark. And stars are forming in here. And uh, we see in between them, stars have already formed, and they've cleared out the material with their radiation. When you look in the infrared, you can actually see through this dust. And uh, so we can see bright stars that are forming inside. Like there's this bright thing right here that you just do not see at all in this photo. And uh, if you look at even longer wavelengths, you can see the dust glowing. So about half of the light in the universe comes out in the infrared. And we won't see it if we only look in visible light that our eyes can see. This is a little animation of uh, what's uh, called a uh, dark cloud. And 
you see here in the visible light uh, there, uh, you can't really see any of the stars in it or behind it. And as you go to infrared, you see there's this uh, embedded young star. It has uh, uh, an outflow. It's uh, uh, it's ejecting material both towards us and away from us. We can see the stuff that's towards us in visible light, but we can't see the stuff that's moving away from us unless we look in the infrared. This is what a nearby galaxy looks like. This thing is another one that uh, if you have a small telescope, it's called a Whirlpool Galaxy. You can, it's in uh, uh, the Big Dipper constellation. And what is interesting here in visible light, this picture, so, you know, the stars are bright, and uh, there are these lanes of dust in between the stars that are, are darker because the dust is obscuring what's there. And if you look in the infrared, it turns out the brightest stars are actually in these lanes of dust because that's where the youngest stars are, the most luminous. They don't live very long and they're forming there and uh, also lighting up the dust. Okay, so I hope that illustrated uh, some of the things we can see beyond the visible wavelengths that our eyes see and particularly in the infrared. The, we uh, wanted to leverage this when we started putting together ideas for James Webb Science. Um, again, we started this about 25 years ago. I think uh, 1998 is the first science working group that uh, met. We knew that its greatest uh, discoveries would be things that we hadn't yet thought of. So we thought if we gave it capabilities for addressing problems, uh, making observations, and different really big areas of interest, it would be uh, capable and be able to work on modern problems. So, and the four, R, uh, four areas we identified were being able to see the first galaxy. So we wanna be able to see the first groups of stars that formed and uh, came together after the Big Bang. So uh, that's only a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. We wanted to see how those galaxies evolve. So uh, the Big Bang was very hot. And uh, I'll go over this uh, again a little later. And then uh, this uh, hot uh, uh, gas condensed out of the universe as it was expanding. It cooled. Gravity pulled the uh, uh, the, the uh, protons together formed atoms, formed stars, and uh, those formed galaxies, and galaxies evolved. I understand how that happened. Also want to understand uh, how stars and planets form, and also be able to understand uh, planetary systems and uh, origins of life. So let's take that first uh, topic, this first light in epoch of uh, reionization. What I'll go through is so, sort of show you what we were thinking about before Webb and, and a glimpse also of what Webb has found so far. So again, uh, the Big Bang was the creation of the universe as we know it. This, uh, uh, and then the, the, the universe expanded very rapidly and it cooled. And after about 400,000 years, well, it cooled enough so that uh, atoms could form. So protons could combine with the electrons and hydrogen atoms could form. And then uh, they could uh, start to uh, come together by gravity. And uh, the first stars formed in uh, less than the first hundred million years and then galaxies in the first few hundred million years. And the light from these first stars and galaxies started to uh, uh, break the atoms apart again. And then so after some time, the, uh, uh, all of the universe is ionized, which means that it's clear so we can see through it and we can see the stars in the present day. And again, this is just a blow up of that picture I showed earlier with uh, the Big Bang. So this is uh, uh, axis is in time. So this is the again, the beginning of the universe as we knew it. The whole universe expanded very quickly. It cooled as it expanded. Stars and galaxies formed. And here we are today. If we look at any given direction in the sky, we'll be able to see all of this sort of piled up on top of each other uh, with the most distant things being the oldest because light has a finite travel time. The other thing, as I mentioned, is that uh, the universe uh, expanded after the Big Bang. It's still expanding. And in fact, its acceleration is increasing, which is something that uh, we found out about in the late 1990s. It sort of blew our minds. And what is uh, going on then is that if uh, something in the early universe emitted invisible light, so and there are uh, a lot of atoms, and as we know, stars emit invisible light. The sun emits invisible light. So if there are stars in the early universe, um, it'd be invisible light, but because the we're moving away from the early universe so fast, as the whole universe expands, it's not just objects in the universe, but the whole universe is moving, is expanding very quickly. The light gets stretched out, becomes redshifted. It's like when you're waiting for Caltrain. 
and you're at the tracks and you hear the whistle coming and it's a, a higher pitch and then it moves by you and it uh, becomes a lower pitch. That's the Doppler effect. And uh, this uh, uh, causes the light to get uh, spread out just like the sound waves do uh, for, for Caltrain. And it shifts from the visible into the infrared. So that's what we were thinking and this is what we see. So this is one of the first images that was uh, released in the middle of July. This is looking at this cluster of uh, massive galaxies, like Southern, massive, something cluster, uh, 0723. And the massive cluster of these bright things there, I think those are like five or eight billion light years away. And what they're doing is they're actually using the mass of this cluster to act as a lens. And the, it's distorting the, these, these galaxy images here. These are actually behind where uh, this, this cluster of galaxies are. And uh, this is something that was predicted by Einstein. And just the mass of these galaxies distorts the light as it passes by them. And uh, so it amplifies the light. So we can uh, sort of use the galaxies as another telescope to amplify the light of these very distant ones. And then we can uh, dissect the light and figure out the, how far away they are, how old they are. So there are things in this uh, image that are probably 13 billion years old. So, and if uh, the Big Bang happened 13.8 billion years ago, within a few hundred million years of the Big Bang. Okay, evolution of galaxies. Let's uh, go to the second point here. So in the beginning, we think that uh, the first groups of stars formed into these things called proto-galaxies, and then uh, these came together gravitationally and then evolved over time to become the kind of complex, well-structured galaxies we have today. This is what the Milky Way would look like if we could get outside of it. Uh, we can see it at night. If you see the Milky Way, it kind of looks like a big uh, uh, sort of bar over the sky. That's because we're inside this disk and we're looking towards the center. So we see the, uh, uh, the, the plane of the disk. So uh, this is what uh, Webb saw of some nearby galaxies. This is Stefan's Quintet. It's been known, I think, at least until uh, uh, at least since the late 1800s. This one's like uh, uh, not physically part of the other ones. So there are there are uh, one, two, three, four, five. This one's about 40 million light years away. These are about uh, 250 million light years away. We see they're interacting. So one of the things James Webb is showing us is that it can see in the infrared. So this is really infrared light that's been uh, sort of coded to appear as red light. And this galaxy is interacting with this one. And where their gas is slamming together, stars are forming. And we can see that these two cores have already done that. They've already interacted. That was a while ago. But uh, uh, now we see there's a lot of star formation from there. So this is just one example of uh, this uh, looking at uh, structured galaxies and how their structure comes about. This is another one that was uh, released uh, yeah, in early August. Uh, it's a, it's a uh, uh, near to uh, mid-infrared image. Like this is this uh, one is in the field. It's a different one. It's uh, much bluer because it uh, has uh, sort of a more mature population of stars. And this has all these stars forming. I think this outer ring is pretty new here. You didn't know about this, uh, uh, these stars forming here. And then this is also tracing where collisions happened. So uh, it looks like there are two rings in here. There's this ring and there's that ring, tracing work collision. So we can really understand dynamics of galaxies through uh, these kinds of images. When Hubble launched, uh, we thought that uh, stars and planets formed in disks of material surrounding young stars that created the young stars. But we didn't have pictures of disks until Hubble. This actually is, I don't think this is a Hubble picture, but uh, Hubble had some similar pictures of such things. And now what we want to do is uh, not only uh, image uh, these kinds of disks, but we want to understand what's in them. We want to understand the kind of molecules that are in these disks and uh, how, if, do they get, uh, are they uh, uh, complex like uh, we need for life? Do they get transported to planets? And also by studying the chemistry of stars and planets, we can understand a little more of their formation. This shows uh, young stars. Again, this is in uh, the Carina Nebula. This is, uh, oh, I think about 7,000 light years away. It's a Hubble visible light image and uh, near infrared light. Again, we can see through this dust in the uh, near infrared, we can see these young stars that uh, in the near infrared that we just can't see uh, in the visible light. However, uh, 
Webb could see a much longer wavelengths than the, the near infrared. This is the picture, uh, not the exact same region, but also in the, in the same uh, general region of the sky of the Carina Nebula that was released in July. It's uh, uh, star formation. Again, these are young stars that formed in uh, dust and, and gas like this. A lot of these tendrils are actually complex molecules, it turns out. And they have cleared out um, the dust from this region, and they've formed what uh, I call a cosmic shoreline. I think the official name was Cosmic Close, but it's really a shoreline. And I like to credit my colleague, Kevin Zonley and NASA Ames coming up with for a slightly different reason. So the radiation from the stars are etch etching away at the, the cloud out of which they form. And you can see there are very bright stars, young stars being formed in this cloud still. So that, that is about my favorite, I think, of uh, the first released images in July. So those are the first science themes. And uh, the uh, oh, uh, one more, uh, planetary systems and the origins of life. So, and bear with me just for a second. I need to uh, change my uh, pointer. Let me see if I can uh, do that. To a... Okay, so now most of the planets we know about were discovered by this technique called the transit technique. This is well, the Kepler mission discovered its planets, and Kepler so far uh, still has discovered most of the 5,000 plus planets we know about. So if you look at a star long enough, it'll eventually dim. So that's what this graph is showing, is when the planet moves in front of the star. You just have to get lucky that the planet is aligned with the star and with us. Uh, the star gets dimmer by about 1% as the planet moves in front of it. And now you see the brightness is going up as the planet moves, moves away. So we can use the same technique with Webb to study planets. And one of the things we're looking for, if we look at rocky planets, like uh, ones we have in our solar system, this shows that uh, Earth, Mars and Venus all have this strong carbon dioxide uh, signature. So this is a spectrum. This is taking the light, dividing it up into uh, different bins, narrow bins of different wavelengths. And in this uh, mid-infrared wavelength, around 15 microns, uh, the uh, uh, planets are much less bright because there are these big absorptions due to carbon dioxide. We know there's a lot of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere, right? It's uh, starting to cause a greenhouse effect. It's causing our planet to heat up. And uh, uh, we, as people, have been uh, producing most of the carbon dioxide here. It came about other ways with uh, Mars and with Venus. Now, Venus is very broad. There's lots of carbon dioxide, and it's broad because it's very high pressure. In fact, it, Venus boiled off all of its oceans. It's a place we don't want to go to. So we can look for things like this. And uh, one thing you'll notice that only Earth has this feature here, and this is called ozone. And it's related, it has three oxygen atoms, and it's closely related to the oxygen molecule, which we need for life and which plants produce. So, and uh, this shows that it's uh, not, in, uh, you wouldn't expect oxygen unless there was life. Uh, we have some great systems to uh, examine. This is the TRAPPIST-1 system. I think it's about 40 light years away from us, and there are seven uh, rocky-ish planets that we'll observe in the first year with Webb. This shows the comparison of the planets um, the, 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 the sexy names, B, C, D, E, F, so the stars over here, and the more distant planets get out over there. So um, once this D planet gets about the same radiation that the Earth does, that's what uh, the distance corresponds to, and is uh, a little smaller, a little less dense. I'm going to be making observations of B to see if it has CO2, like we saw in the last graph. Other people have already observed C. And we had a... Uh, uh, I think this came out on uh, Monday. Uh, this was a uh, news release of, or maybe it was last week, maybe it was last Thursday or Friday. This is first detection of carbon dioxide in an exoplanet. This is a WASP-39b. There's a survey on the ground called WASP. Uh, a bunch of uh, Irish people uh, started it. And this is uh, at wavelengths that are really long. So the eye can see out to about... Uh, uh, 0 0.7 microns. And so this is almost, this is about eight times longer than what the eye can see. And uh, there's this big absorption to CO2. And we can just never have the ability to be able to divide the light up like this before. We thought it existed, and now we know it does. 
So uh, we know that there's important carbon-bearing molecules. So that's my um, uh, intro on the science. I'm going to go talk about uh, the observatory now. If there are any pressing questions about the science, I could take uh, one or two of them now, but also be taking questions after the whole talk. Yeah, so a couple questions that I think were specific to slides you just showed. Um, one that came through, somebody asked, can the light be different colors? And I believe they asked this when you were explaining the infrared light in the beginning of the presentation. Oh yeah, because what we're seeing is, uh, uh, when we're seeing this infrared light here, you know, uh, this is just a, a very broad swath. And uh, we, uh, the different colors are very broadly uh, defined. We have a, a couple different infrared colors assigned here to make some, the shorter ones bluer, the longer wavelength ones redder. But what we can do too, is we can divide up that light into uh, what's called a spectrum. And that's what we're getting uh, uh, like this planet spectrum here is this is uh, infrared light. So from three microns, so that's about, uh, oh, four or five times longer than what the eye can see, all the way out to five microns. And uh, that's getting close to about eight times longer than the eye can see. So every little dot there is a different color. Okay, and then just one more. Um, I don't remember if you showed this photo or if we've just seen it shared from James Webb. Um, somebody asked if you can point out the five Stefan's Quintet. Yeah, so let's go back here. I thought I did that, but uh, all right. So this this is Stefan's Quintet. So one, two, three, four, five. So, but we got this other one there too. That's something that Stefan didn't see. This one is not physically associated. There are a bunch of other galaxies. I mean, you look, you look at any. James Webb photo, it's gonna be lousy with galaxies. There's one there, there's ones there, there's ones there. Anything that's fuzzy like that is a galaxy. There's a galaxy there. Those are all more distant than uh, the five main ones in the quintet. Okay, thank you. And I will save the rest for uh, later or maybe the end. <laughs> okay, great. So i um, like to say a few words about the observatory and uh, we have to make something pretty different and it looks pretty different. You know, it's not your average uh, garden variety telescope that you see at Target. All right, so it has two sides to it. This is the side, this business side. Uh, it's got the mirror, so uh, light comes in from star, planet, or galaxy, hits the mirror, and then the mirror focuses it to this other mirror, which sends it through this hole, and all the detecting instruments from the sensors are on the back there. And uh, this has to be really cold because this looks in the infrared. And as we learned, uh, or, or may have learned, is that things that have uh, heat emit in the infrared. So uh, anything that's warm emits in the infrared. So the telescope has to be cold so that uh, its own uh, thermal emission doesn't drown out the uh, infrared radiation from space. So the way it gets cold is that there's this five layer sunshade there. And uh, this side is always towards cold space. It took uh, several weeks for it to mostly cool off. This side is towards the sun and the earth. And uh, it's not orbiting the Earth. I'll show you where it's orbiting later. This is the antenna for communicating. This is the solar panel. So this is the warm side. Actually, this is warmer than room temperature. That's the back side of the sunshade. And then these layers help uh, get the heat out so that this telescope can cool. And I'll show you the temperatures later. But it's only about, uh, about 80 degrees Fahrenheit above absolute zero. So like uh, minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit or something. This shows the size of web, the web mirror. So this, the size of the mirror is what determines how much light it collects. So the power of the observatory. And it's six and a half meters diameter or 25 meters, uh, square meters in area. Hubble's 2.4 meters, so it's a lot bigger. So uh, about a factor of five, more than a factor of five difference in area. Spitzer was the uh, other infrared observatory that we had. It was less than a meter. So uh, James Webb has about uh, over 50 times more area than Spitzer. The mirrors are coated with gold and they're made out of beryllium. Uh, beryllium because it's light. Beryllium is only like the fourth element in the uh, periodic table. It, uh, it's, it's wild. It, it's uh, the way you uh, make something out of beryllium, you start the powder, it gets mined like in Utah. It's very toxic and uh, you don't wanna, uh, and it's easy to breathe this powder. You really don't wanna do that. And you, they press it into uh, the blanks. They sent the blanks out to, uh, L3 Tinsley, which is now this company called a Coherent. This was in Richmond. They actually um, uh, pretty much did the hard work on the mirrors at uh, on, on Webb. 
And uh, we have different kinds of mirrors. There are 18 that go into uh, the primary mirror here. And we also have the secondary mirror, which is this one, and another one inside called the tertiary and this uh, steering mirror. This uh, shows some of the testing. So we had to make the mirrors warm because all the polishing machines are all big and uh, they're made to operate warm. We can't operate them cold, but the telescope has to operate cold. So, and it's things are going to shrink and they're not going to shrink totally uniformly. So uh, Tinsley would make some of these mirrors. They would estimate how they would shrink. They would, uh, you know, put that into their calculations. Then they put them into this uh, cryogenic test chamber in Alabama, the Marshall Space Flight Center. So this is like showing the shrouds that uh, allowed cooling this. They pump all the air out. This is uh, all the mirrors, uh, the set of mirrors. They do uh, up to six at a time there and, uh, and, and test them separately. And they would then have to like tweak the figure and test again. So it was quite a convoluted thing. It was also quite convoluted to align the telescope. This is the process that we did after it launched. So. When we first had to get the telescope open. I'll show you that later, what, uh, how the telescope was folded up. It has to uh, get open. And then we uh, had to look for images. We saw 18 images for every star because there are 18 segments. And then we had to uh, uh, get the segments evenly spaced, which is what's going on there, the segment search and segment uh, uh, array. And uh, then we had to uh, do a global alignment of these. So we're starting to focus them separately. And then we stack them up. And uh, then we uh, course phase them because we can, there's one thing to stack up all the uh, images and in the individual mirror segments, but then they, you have to make the whole mirror work as one single big mirror. And that's what this phasing was about. And it uses these uh, funky optics that we had in our uh, near infrared camera. So in the end, it took about a month and we get a telescope that is not just uh, 18 separate mirrors, but one big telescope that has really sharp images that's functioning, uh, uh, all of its 18 mirrors functions as one big telescope. We've built other telescopes like that. Uh, the most famous one on the ground is Keck. This is in Hawaii. It's the world's biggest telescope. There are two of them actually uh, right next to each other. Uh, they're 10 meters in diameter versus the six and a half meters of Keck. So that means they've got about three times the area. So uh, Keck is big. I mean, look at this person sitting in the middle of uh, uh, this, uh, in the middle of the mirror there when the telescope's pointed towards the horizon. This uh, determines sort of how curved and uh, the mirror is and how short. Uh, James Webb is shorter because it had to fit into the rocket. What wavelengths it can observe. So uh, 600 nanometers or, or, or 0.6 microns is red light. So you can see from red light out to very much longer wavelengths than the eye can see. Uh, Keck can see sort of that's below our blue limit. So we can see at the limit of which the uh, atmosphere lets in ultraviolet light out to about five microns. Uh, so that's about uh, uh, eight times longer than the eye can see. There are 18 segments on uh, Webb, 36 on Keck. Now check this out. So uh, each segment on uh, Webb only weighs 20 kilograms, so less, less than 50 pounds, versus 20 times that on Keck because we can't, we can't launch much mass into space. All of Webb, including fuel, for 20 years weighs only six tons, whereas it's 270 tons for Keck for the rotating part. And because Keck can be, uh, because the space telescopes can be pretty efficient, it's only about 10 times more per hour to operate once you amortize the cost. That's a very rough number, I should say. So that's um, the basics about the telescope. I'll talk a little bit about the uh, science instruments next. So after um, collecting all the light, it has to go somewhere and you have to detect it. So it's like your uh, uh, phone or your digital camera has to have both a lens and a sensor. So we've got four different kinds of cameras uh, or, or instruments in web. Uh, these three uh, work at near infrared wavelengths. So this is like from the, uh, a red color that the eye can see from 0.6 microns out to five microns. This is uh, a very versatile spectrograph. All it does is dice up the light. It can't really uh, take pictures. Uh, Nearest can take pictures and also dice up the light. And uh, near cam uh, is, the, is the main camera. And it can also uh, dice up the light in a spectra. There's also a mid infrared instrument that works at really long wavelengths. And it uh, both takes pictures and records spectrum. This shows sort of how uh, big they are on the sky. This, this is the same galaxy I showed earlier. There was the comparison of visible, have the line down and visible and infrared. This is something that's, uh, you know, arc minutes across. So it's something that is 
smaller than like your pinky held at arm's length, but uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, a tenth of a full moon kind of thing across. And uh, this sort of shows the fields of uh, the instruments. They're not arranged like that. They're actually arranged like this, sort of on the sky, with a telescope uh, sort of hole in the in the middle there. NIRCAM has uh, these coronagraphs that we can put in, and uh, they can blot out a bright star, so we can see fainter things around it, like planets. Miri has those too. That's a, those are Miri's coronagraph stars, the mid infrared imager, and its spectrograph is there. Nearest and NIRSPEC. NIRSPEC is pretty cool. Uh, it can. Uh, you can open it, it has these shutters across its detectors. You can open one and it'll take a spectrum of the object that uh, is uh, where the shutter lets the light through. So you can uh, uh, take spectra of hundreds of objects at a time. This shows the near infrared camera. I'm not going to get too geeky here, but I'm just showing this one slide because this was made in Palo Alto at Lockheed Martin. And uh, it's not only uh, a primo science instrument, but it also was used to align the telescope. It had to be very redundant. It has two identical modules. And if you look at it, it looks like it's a mirror image, right? What's on top versus what's on bottom, which is uh, there were there were two things like this that are put together uh, at, at the benches there. And this shows what uh, some of the shortwave detector arrays look like. This shows the telescope when it was being built at the Goddard Space Flight Center in a clean room. Uh, we were working, testing the instruments at the time. It was fun to walk by uh, on the outside. Uh, didn't want to let us on the inside to get things dirty. And you can see like new mirror segments getting put in. This is uh, the instruments, all the instruments here. Uh, uh, each that This thing here is uh, the, the spectrograph, the uh, near called near spec. This is near cam. Uh, this is uh, nearest, this is Miri. So everything was together there. We tested them in another uh, cold test chamber and they were put together on the back and put on the back of the mirror. This shows uh, getting that whole assembly, that mirror and the instruments around the back into this big test chamber in Texas. Things are bigger in Texas, right? This is the Houston Space Center, uh, so, sorry, the Johnson Space Center in Houston. And uh, they have this huge test chamber here. They actually put the uh, whole Apollo command and service modules in for testing before uh, they launched the Apollo program. We retrofitted it to be able to take it cold and we tested the whole telescope. We want to make sure that uh, we can have an end-to-end -end test. We we're going to have the problem that Hubble did where the images were fuzzy at the start. So that was uh, very worthwhile and that uh, was quite an enterprise and we made it through Hurricane Harvey. The uh, This shows the telescope here with parts of it folded. So this is the secondary's folded and the wings are folded on the primary. This is, has been mated to the sunshade. This is down at Northrop Grumman in uh, Redondo Beach in Southern California. And this is the whole assembly. Now the sunshade is folded back in. It's in this kind of purple stuff and it's being folded together on the telescope. You can see now this is one of the wings of mirrors and uh, this is the secondary. The yellow stuff here is just uh, sort of ground equipment that's uh, used to uh, help uh, hold things because um, it's a little hard to test and move things around uh, in Earth gravity because it's all designed to work in zero gravity. This is a picture of uh, a completed telescope all packed up, ready for launch. This is uh, the, this gray thing is the adapter ring that actually bolts to the rocket. And this is before it shipped out of uh, Northrop Grumman, which was uh, around, I think, the uh, fall of last year. So right around a year ago is it uh, shipped out of Northrop Grumman. Uh, any pressing questions about uh, the hardware at this point before I get into uh, the next and last phase? Um, we did have a couple questions. Uh, you may have answered some of them. So let's see quickly. Um, one person asked how many kilograms of gold it used. Ah, that's a great question. It's uh, grams of gold. I think it's about two ounces, so something like 50 grams. I have that on one of my slides. Let me see if I can go back there. The uh, I got asked that, and uh, I, I, I put in. So uh, let's see. And no, I don't have it on the slide. But it's about 50 grams for uh, all the mirrors there. Okay. And then um, somebody, this is kind of related to the hardware, but somebody said they read that one of the mirrors was hit by a meteoroid. 
And if ah. that's true, how can they fix it? Oh, yeah, yeah. So I got a picture of that later. All right, we'll get okay. to that one. All so right, so are we ready? Mm -hmm. All right, so the mission. The uh, web was built by uh, the NASA was the senior partner. It was roughly 80%-ish NASA, about 20% uh, Europe, about 5% Canada. That adds up to 105, right? So I don't know the exact percentages. And it's a little hard to figure this out as to uh, who did what. Or we know who did what, but I don't know how that you know all combines to value. This it was launched from uh, so um, you know I showed you the telescope and it was being uh, built here at Goddard. The mirrors were, were made here. The uh, spacecraft was made down around the beach. The cameras made here. Europe made one and a half of the instruments. Made the mid the half the mid infrared instrument. And made the uh, um, spectrograph Canada made uh, this nearest instrument. It was launched by Europe at their launch site uh, at uh, Kourou in French Guiana. So this is where the European Space Agency has its launch site. And it launched on Christmas Day of last year. Now, I showed you those four sort of big science themes earlier that we're thinking about, uh, you know, starting like 24 years ago about what web should be capable of doing. So this is what it will be doing in the first year. So uh, proposals were open a couple of years ago. People proposed for what they wanted to uh, do with web. And uh, this is how things came in. So about 25% of the time of the request and uh, the time will go out proportional to the request, uh, although it is oversubscribed, but it will go out in the same fraction. So about 25% of the time is requested for exoplanets and disks. That was one of the four themes. And uh, then about 25% of the time, 13 plus 12, is for stars. So this is stellar physics and stellar populations. So this is studying systems of stars, and this is studying uh, stars uh, themselves and, as objects. Then galaxies, groups of stars. So that was about a quarter. So those are sort of like three of the four themes. And the rest of it was uh, uh, cosmology, sort of uh, how we can use the, uh, how we can study the early universe and the evolution of the universe to, to understand how uh, the universe formed and evolved, and black holes, and also some solar system objects. So solar system and uh, exoplanets were like the biggest fraction. This is a cartoon of what it looked like folded up into the fairing or nose cone of the rocket. It was launched on an Ariane 5. ESA, which is the European Space Agency, uh, had a really primo uh, uh, Ariane 5 picked out. You get an idea of this, an Ariane 5 is a little more capable than the SpaceX Falcon 9 for uh, rocket aficionados. This uh, is a picture of the launch. It was it launched at, right at the beginning launch window, which is 4.20 a.m. Pacific time, which was 7.20 Eastern and I think like 9.20 in French Guiana because they're the further east. This is one of the last pictures we had of Webb. So normally the uh, European Space Agency doesn't have cameras on their upper stages, but they put one on because they thought Webb was important. It's important to take a look. So we have Earth limb here, that's Webb there. So uh, when it was ready to go, it had been given uh, the boost it needed, just uh, uh, release some bolts and a spring, push it away and it drifted away actually fairly slowly. It was kind of cool to watch it live. And a few seconds later, the solar array deployed. And that was really important. So we could actually see this happen. And uh, because it was working on batteries until the solar array deployed with the sun on it so that it could uh, uh, start getting power. The first, uh, uh, the, the deployments took about two weeks. And so what we saw earlier was uh, after it uh, launched, we saw the telescope was in this configuration. Those Ariane images were this, just looking in the back of it as it's going away. And then after uh, a couple of days, these uh, arms come down, they're called uh, uh, palette assemblies and uh, started to spread, spread out the sunshade. So the sunshade was about a week from all these different assemblies to deploy. And then the telescope started to uh, uh, arrange itself. The first thing was the secondary mirror popped out and then the wings came out, the whole telescope sort of popped up off of uh, the spacecraft. And uh, that was about another week. So we're all, very happy. You may have heard that there was something like 350 potential failures during the sequence, and we didn't have anything catastrophic. In fact, we had very little minor also during that time. This sort of shows uh, where it went. So 
from Earth here. So that the, that's launched was 33 minutes. That's when that solar array deployed. We saw that picture of, and this is when it's going that first two weeks. Then it went through the sunshade deployment and uh, the mirrors. It go it went out to this point called uh, L2. It uh, went away from the uh, Earth in the direction opposite from the sun, which you can see there. And the uh, this is not to scale. So the sun's here, the Earth's here. This L2 point is a stable point in the Earth-Sun system. And uh, we've had a number of astrophysics observatories uh, operating here. They orbit about this point. So Webb is there now. This is about a million miles away from Earth. And so that's about four times further than the moon. And uh, it's going to move around uh, uh, with the Earth as the Earth moves around the sun. We think there's enough fuel for uh, 20 years, actually more than 20 years of operations, because it's, it's a really precision launch by the Ariane rocket. And also we had to make only minor mid-course corrections. That was beautiful. We're starting to actually think about how to operate the instruments and minimize moves so that we get as uh, much lifetime as we can out of the mechanisms. And radiation is probably ultimately going to limit uh, lifetime uh, on either on electronics or the detectors. Uh, we asked someone asked earlier about micrometeorites. We're expecting about 10 a year, and that's about the rate we've been seeing. One of them was a little bigger than we expected, and uh, you can see a picture of it here. So uh, this was uh, 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 ground measurements from the individual segments. So this is as good as they could get. This is the space measurements, and you see they're all really good comparable to the ground, except here there's a there's a hole, and that was caused by this uh, micrometeorite. Now, given that, it's still performing about twice as good in its overall image quality as uh, we had specified. So it's only 60 nanometers uh, uh, RMS error for uh, optics nerds. So that means that it can see very sharply even down in visible light. So optical quality is excellent. Some science highlights. OK, uh, it's been really hard to keep track of these things. So I showed you uh, some of the first pictures that were released in mid-July. The, uh, I should say, so it was launched on Christmas Day. It took about six months to do the majority of the commissioning. So it was commissioned until uh, late June. Spent about a week doing some initial science images. So those science images I showed you earlier, like the uh, uh, what I call the Cosmic Shoreline, Stefan's Quintet that we talked about, those other ones, the SMACs, uh, gravitational lensing, those are just the first taste of science this is going to do. That's what we could put together a few hours of each. So uh, the analogy I've given, it's kind of like going into a winery saying, hey, give me a taste of this. And they'll pour a little bit, just a splash in the glass. You'll get uh, an idea of the scent and the taste. And then you'll buy a few cases or something, you know, if you really like wine. And so the, the, the cases are going to come out over the 20 year lifetime. What we've had is the taste of the glass. So and but it's pretty impressive. So we found the oldest galaxies in the universe. So right now they're candidates. They need to be followed up with uh, spectroscopy with Webb, but it looks like they're things at redshift of 17. Uh, on the ground, we didn't have things uh, redshift much more than 10. So that means that these objects are very, uh, uh, they were formed very shortly after the Big Bang. They could be less than 250 million years old. We didn't know that galaxies existed, that, that well-structured galaxies like this existed that young. So this is already um, probably rewriting the textbook. So also we're finding the, these very high redshift emission line galaxies. So we're getting uh, actual, uh, this is an actual spectrum. So we're actually confirming uh, this. So this is a candidate, this is confirmed. I'm working on a new paper we're going to have four more of these. And this is just with only about 10 minutes of data from our tests. From our tests. Uh, found a first supernova. We've gotten some great Jupiter images. Uh, I showed you that first detection of CO2 in an exoplanet. And uh, today, what came out was uh, first exoplanet uh, observed at mid-infrared wavelengths. This is a, OK, so science is getting uh, you know released on Twitter these days. So of course, in, and also in more uh, scientific journals away. But this is uh, the person showing this oldest galaxy, the Z of uh, 17, uh, 35 billion light years away. So uh, very impressive. This is this uh, high Z uh, mission line galaxy. So this is uh, uh, these, these bright spots. 
are like individual spectral lines. For those that had chemistry, you looked at hydrogen lamps, or you look at uh, sodium lamps. I don't know if Mountain View, I don't know if Santa Clara still has them. Uh, they've been replaced a lot of places to LEDs, but you have just like this bright single color. And this is it shifted way into the infrared. And by that shift, we can tell uh, how far away they are and how young. This was uh, released a couple weeks ago. This uh, wild image of Jupiter. And the coloring is completely artificial, right? Because it's seeing an infrared light our eyes can't see. So uh, there's actually an outreach person who did this coloring. And there's a nice uh, um, uh, article on it. Uh, these are these hazes around the aurora. So uh, just like the Earth has northern and southern lights, so does Jupiter. And this image, this single image, is so sensitive, uh, we can actually see uh, its rings and see these very small moons. It's uh, uh, quite impressive. And uh, this is, uh, uh, won't get into it, this is an optical artifact here, it's uh, diff diffraction spikes. And this was, uh, today's or yesterday's, I, I forget, the days run together, but this was uh, first uh, direct image of an exoplanet. This was uh, done by uh, Aaron Carter. There is a set of science called early release science. So uh, there's this exoplanet image, the one with that CO2 of the planet showed you, that was part of the early release science program. Aaron Carter is uh, a postdoctoral scholar at UC Santa Cruz. This sort of shows uh, the star on, a, on an image, the bright star, and we knew about this planet. So uh, these early science images are just kind of looking at things we know about and uh, seeing what Webb can do. So this is showing the planet nearby in these different wavelengths. So this is uh, near cam. So this is at three microns wavelength. So that's something like uh, uh, four or five times longer than what the eye can see all the way out to 15 microns wavelength, which is uh, over 20 times longer than what the eye can see. And this shows uh, these new points on a spectrum. So uh, for, for these exoplanets, that was the same planet, uh, you know, seeing it is cool, but uh, by measuring the brightness, we can understand what's in the atmosphere of the planet. So in the past, we only had these ground images, which was uh, this set here, taken by uh, the sphere in NACO. These are uh, ground-based images in the Southern Hemisphere. And uh, actually, uh, this is with uh, the Europeans uh, uh, had, had an observatory where they took that data. And all the orange ones are web. And it fits this model beautifully. So uh, they can actually you know, uh, model the different kinds of chemicals in the atmosphere of the planet to get uh, the model to match the James Webb points. OK, so. I've gone into a lot of details, but I thought it'd also be worth hitting some of the big pictures about how all of us are going to benefit from web. So I hope I've illustrated, you know, maybe in a technical sense, uh, some of the questions that we as people have been asking for thousands of years. So those are, what is in the universe? What's out there besides us? And uh, that's where we see all the different galaxies. Uh, how and uh, how old is it? That's uh, something we can also see. That, uh, we're looking at the redshifts of all of these objects. How did we get here? How did the galaxies evolve? How did stars and planets form? Are we alone? Are there other planets that have conditions conducive for life? So uh, this is how I think that what Webb will do in the white is going to address some of those big questions and you know sort of hit on a number of these during the talk so far. I'm not going to go and, uh, and read those. And a little more practical term, it's also really advanced our scientific technology. Um, Bay Area in California has really benefited. So, uh, you know, uh, Tinsley made the mirrors. Uh, Lockheed Martin made the, in Palo Alto, made the uh, near cam instrument. Uh, and Northrop Grumman down in uh, Redondo Beach made the spacecraft people all over the world. So there are about uh, a thousand people all over the world helped build the web. And so it's already brought a thousand people together. And we really hope that all its discoveries will bring even more of the world together. So that's what I have. And I'm happy to take any questions at this point. All right. Um, thank you, Dr. Green. That was great. We actually have a lot of questions. So I'm going to try to ask them in a way that makes sense. Um, so first, there were a couple questions about, um, well, first, one that I should have asked earlier when you were showing us the TRAPPIST, somebody asked what happened to TRAPPIST A. Oh, the planets, it's sort of a weird naming scheme. They start with B because they're, they're named after their star. And the, uh, the idea is that the star is the A thing. 
So Trappist 1A, if it was if there was such a thing, would just refer to the star that hosts all the planets. Thank you. I wondered the same thing when you showed that slide, so I'm glad somebody asked that. <laughs> um, yeah, usually you'll hear you'll hear about some new planet being discovered, and often it's a B, because then that means it's the first planet discovered around a particular star. That is a great trivia question knowledge. Okay, so we got some questions about the photography. Um, and you might have touched on some of this, so if you just want to expand a little bit. Um, somebody asked how the telescope sends the pictures back to Earth. Oh, that's a very uh, relevant question. So it uses the Deep Space Network. There's this big dish on the back. The uh, telescope, um, this article came out in some of the, the tech uh, blogs. It's got, um, I think, less, uh, less uh, storage than my phone here. So it's got about 68 gigabytes of solid state disk space. And uh, it was designed a long time ago, and it also has to be radiation hard. If you just put the kind of memory that's our phones in space, uh, not going to do very well because uh, it's uh, a lot of high energy radiation comes in and hits the silica and bad things happen. So um, every so when we were first doing uh, the checkout, we had contact 24 hours a day. And with the Deep Space Network. Deep Space Network is a set of three sites around the world. It's used to talk to uh, Mars probes and things that uh, go far out, uh, things outside of Earth orbit usually. There's one in Southern California, there's one in, outside Madrid in Spain, there's one in Australia. So uh, uh, one of those is usually covering any, point in port, any part of the sky at one time. Uh, one of the, so now we're talking about a couple times a day. One issue is, as if uh, you may have heard about this new Artemis mission that uh, is going to, the NASA wants to launch, it's going to monopolize that network. And if it launches this weekend, Webb will have to sit idle for about uh, five or 10 days because they'll be using uh, the dishes that Webb talks to to talk to this other spacecraft. Hmm. I never would have thought that that would be connected. So that's good to know. Um, somebody else asked if you can cover how the raw pictures are processed to create the final images and how the colors are recreated from infrared. Yeah, so it's actually, it's not too different from uh, visible light sensors in our phones. So what happens is, is that uh, the sensors here detect a pretty wide range of, uh, of light or radiation and we use filters. So if we wanna look in visible light, you know, we've got actually a red filter that goes in front. And if we wanna look in infrared, we can put short, medium, long infrared filters. And then uh, what happens is, is that, uh, you know, that light gets just converted into a signal in electrons. And, it, you know, in every pixel, some are brighter than others. And we get that pattern, we bring that down. And then how we assign it to brightness, uh, the most of uh, we usually start with just monochrome so that uh, a brighter uh, pixel in uh, one filter is just going to be brighter in uh, in gray and we can look at it two different filters and say oh this one's brighter in the redder filter than the bluer filter and you can start to assign colors to them too so then uh, uh, and then you know the magic happens like uh, that image I showed of uh, of Jupiter here for example you know, people looked at the shorter wavelengths where these hazes are, and they assigned those into blue, which is actually pretty cool because hazes uh, generally are blue. Um, another question about the images, what's the frequency of the images we can expect from web? So I guess how often are we going to get these? Right. So the uh, I'm aware of at least 10 of these early science programs that got observed in that period in late June to early July. They've released, I think, uh, five early science uh, images. That was the uh, uh, that SPAX uh, cluster of the gravitationally distorted lenses, cosmic shoreline. There was the exoplanet spectrum. There was Stefan's quintet and uh, uh, something else. <laughs> so uh, the uh, so I think they they still are on a number of those. The early and what's happening now is that individual investigators have taken their own data. This early release science program, uh, there are about 500 hours of observations taken between a number of different programs. They are going to be releasing uh, images near constantly. So I mean, I think it's going to be a couple times a week, and it's only sort of going to get more frequent. And it's just going to be a matter of uh, uh, what the press wants to do uh, when people get uh, tired of it. So. Uh, 
let me go to uh, this slide here. So uh, this webtelescope.org is a pretty deep site here for a lot of info. Uh, blogs is where uh, uh, a lot of new science results uh, in a succinct post get released, you know, a couple times a week. So you want to look, look there. These are uh, probably the two biggest ones. And also the project has a website that's got a more archival material. Thank you. Um, we had a question about a specific slide. Um, so the early science image of the first direct image of an exoplanet found with Webb. Do you remember yeah. what it was? <laughs> okay. um, this person asked what the glowing bulges were on either side of the planet. Okay, let me go back. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I was prepared for that. I thought it's a sharp eye. So what happens is, is that uh, you see, when you take pictures of these stars, they got these spikes there. So that's actually an artifact of how the telescope is made. And that's because of uh, the edges of the mirrors. And if you look closely at uh, an image, a web image, and there have been even some of these releases on there, they're like, uh, there's sort of a pattern, a uh, six-sided uh, pattern because the segments are of six sides. And so it's sort of like not just spikes up and down. Those are the those are the bright ones. And actually, this isn't a web image in the background. That's why they're uh, they they don't have the uh, uh, the web spikes. But uh, what to what we have to do? We have to have these things called coronagraphs that suppress the light of the star, and they do kind of weird things to the light. They add sort of these artifacts of uh, of uh, these these images. So uh, it's kind of technical. It uh, kind of changes the shape of the mirror in a way that uh, it gives uh, images that uh, don't look like uh, points without the chronograph. So these two have similar chronographs. You see they got the same kind of shape. These have different chronographs. These here don't have the same kind of uh, pupil mass, what this is called, as these here. These are kind of more natural in, uh, in how they uh, shape the light. OK, thank you. Um... Another, a lot of people are talking about or asking about things that they've seen or read in the news, which is neat because it means people are following along with this. Um, so somebody asked uh, or says that certain articles claim that James Webb has disproven the Big Bang Theory. Is that true? Horse hooey, 100%. <laughs> All right. No, if anything, what, what, it ha what I think it has done is it showed us, I mean, we know the Big Bang. The Big Bang absolutely happened, uh, as we know from uh, some of the 1950s. And uh, uh, but we didn't know pretty much is a lot of what happened between the Big Bang and the sort of the first stars and galaxies and all that. And Webb has helped has helped us understand that better. And it has uh, shown us that these galaxies form earlier than we thought, but you know not before the Big Bang, still way after the hundreds of millions of years after the Big Bang. That was a very definitive answer. Thank you. <laughs> um, somebody else also asked, a couple of people are looking forward, um, asking, like, I think you talked about the mission life. People are asking, um, is James Webb going to come back to Earth when it's done? Um, how far has it gone so far? And is there plans for like a James Webb version two in the future? Yeah, so uh, no user serviceable parts inside. Uh, you know, the thing had to fold up, you know, it's like a ship in a bottle, right? The thing had to fold up to get into the rocket. It unfolded. It's really fragile. There's no way it's going to withstand reentry. You know, uh, we don't have a spacecraft that can get there. We have no way of servicing it. If we could get there, then we'd probably contaminate it because uh, the mirror is so cold, then any kind of uh, use of gas or, uh, or, or, or any kind of uh, um, uh, release of gas would freeze out and, and mess up the mirrors. Um, is there a successor plan? Yes. So every 10 years, uh, the astronomers in the U.S. get together, uh, sort of shepherded by the National Academy of Sciences, figure out what we want for the next decade. So put together an idea for a telescope about the size of web, but it'll work in visible light. And that's a lot harder because the optics have to be better. And it's going to be able to do um, kind of higher quality stuff like this. These this, this is a giant planet. We knew about this planet. This thing is probably the size of Jupiter. I, I didn't look up this particular one. It's probably the size of Jupiter or Saturn. And But with this new observatory, we hope to be able to see uh, planets like Earth. That'll probably launch in the 2040s. Which actually doesn't sound that far away. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> 
All right. Um, let's see. We're almost up on seven o'clock. We had um because you mentioned the Artemis. Uh, and other people might have this question too. We had somebody mention they heard about the Artemis launch, but they heard it got canceled. I think I heard that it got postponed. Um, can you just talk a little bit about what happened and what Artemis is going to be doing in space? Yeah, so uh, the, the first try didn't happen. It's a brand new rocket, you know, and uh, I don't know if a uh, brand new rocket has ever been 100% successful on its first uh, try. So not a big surprise. They didn't launch it. That was uh, scheduled for Monday. Uh, the next launch slot, they'll try on Saturday. And uh, I know there was a launch slot on Monday. I don't know if those will try for that or not. So I'm um, hoping it won't launch around the weekend because that's that would be the worst because uh, just where uh, the moon is because Artemis is going to go to the moon and James Webb and Artemis is going to part of the sky. If they wait a week, it'll be a lot better. Um, and then, and, oh, I should tell you a little bit about what it's going to do. That was the other yeah. part of the question. So it's a 42 day mission. This is a, a new rocket. It's called the SLS. Uh, uh, well, the uh, something launch system, <laughs> and uh, it has a, uh, it's very much Apollo style. It's not reusable, it's huge. It's about the size of a Saturn V. It could launch uh, like uh, probably thousands of tons to Earth orbit and uh, probably hundreds of tons to the moon. And this is going to uh, launch on an orbit around the moon. It's going to kind of loiter around the moon for uh, a 42 day mission. And uh, it says test flight, there are no people aboard, but this spacecraft is capable of carrying people. And the next flight, if this is successful, will be in 2024, and that will likely carry people. Well, that's neat. Well, maybe we'll do a program with you in 2024 about, um, <laughs> about that. Um, just a, one more, we got a couple questions on like the same topic um, about light. So one person was asking, you know, since light takes a long time to see, does that mean we're looking billions of years into the past? Um, somebody else asked if light is energy, how does it have a finite travel time? Mm -hmm. And sorry, this, this is too much at once, but and if light can only travel so far, how are we seeing colors from so far away? So just basic questions about how light travels and the time. Right. So uh, the good news is all the colors travel at the same speed in space. It's because uh, it's different, like in a prism or something. That's uh, if you use a prism, the reason why you can it spreads light out is because in the prism material, it doesn't uh, travel at the same speed. But space is complete vacuum. So light travels, all the colors travel at the same speed. Yes, uh, for something really uh, far away, it takes a finite amount of time. You know, uh, you know, light's really fast. It's 186,000 miles per second, but it's not infinity. So uh, you get an idea. Sound is about 700 miles an hour. If you've ever like looked at something far away and you hear a really loud noise, like a pile driver or something, and you look at it, and so the noise is out of phase, you know, because you hear the sound later than which than how you see it. So uh, uh, and uh, being energy. Um, yeah, it's got a uh, finite travel time. So that uh, even though it, it is energy, it uh, would take a uh, an infinite amount of energy to move something at the to, to move something at the speed of light. But light uh, does travel at, at its uh, finite speed. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Green. I think um, that will be all for tonight since we are a couple minutes past seven. Um, so thank you everybody for coming. Thank you again to Dr. Green. This was great. I learned a lot. So I'm sure the people uh, attending learned a lot as well. Um, and we hope to see you at future library programs. And um, thank you again. Okay. And then uh, I'd like to also thank everybody that attended. And I would like to just end on this one slide where somebody asked about uh, gravitational lensing. And uh, that's just all this distortion there of uh, caused by gravity. So gravity could be a, from a massive object could be a lens. And I'll, I'll wish you all a good night too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.